Thank you so much. Hello. Okay. Would you like me, Jared? Here. It is fine. That's great. great. That's great. So, who's got a Monzo account here? <laughs> wow. Great. Okay, that's good. Good start. That's probably at half the room, Tom. So you're doing something right, but you're doing more than that. Uh, we'll get to that in a, in a second. So, welcome. I hope you're having a good day. Today, I have the great, great privilege and honor to interview Tom, who is the founder and CEO of Monzo, which has raised over 100 million pounds, Tom, and doing very well. It's 700,000 customers to boot, and that's just in one market. So as you know, you need one of these and one of these to operate it. That's all you need. And probably in the future, you just need this, presumably. And then we're going to get to that. So Tom, let's start. We'll do this in two parts. The first part is you as a person. The second part is the industry and mm -hmm. what you're trying to disrupt. Sounds good. If you use that word. So Tom, uh, 10 years in Hong Kong and Singapore. And then you came to this country and studied here. That's right. Tell us a little bit more about what formed you to be the Tom Bloomfield that we all are getting to know. So um, my parents moved to Southeast Asia uh, very, very young when they were 21 or 22 and spent 20-odd uh, years uh, in Hong Kong and, and then Singapore. And from a very early age, from almost um, as early as I can remember, I, I always wanted to run my own business. My father started a construction company that built a lot of the infrastructure in China and Malaysia. Um, and building a company was just, it, it seemed obvious to me from when I was this high that it's what I wanted to do. Um, early times of megalomania, perhaps. I don't know. You're a coder. Yeah. So you're quite humble about that. Yeah, I, I'm not a very good coder. Uh, I'd say I'm like a 6 out of 10 developer. Um, we, we work with a lot of very, very good um, engineers at Monzo. And so a couple of years ago, I got my GitHub my access revoked. Um, but yeah, I, I came back to the UK in about 1995, and by about 98, discovered the internet. Like, got first um, uh, dial-up modem and then ISTN, and discovered the internet, and I, I just loved it. But I, 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 I was in... Um, what sorry. did you love specifically, Tom? The idea that I, as a 13 or 14-year-old, could create something and put it up there, and the whole world could look at it. There's this great, um, I think it's XKDC or something, like, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Um, and just the idea that I, I didn't have to ask permission or like get some kind of publishing deal or anything. I could just write some code and publish this thing. But no one I knew was a, a coder, really, no one at all. And so I learned to code by, by right-clicking and inspecting, you know, like view source and then changing the HTML to be like, I wonder if I can make this red or put my name instead of like the title. And then just organically, I, I learned HTML and then PHP and then plugged into databases. And I, I spent most of my teenage years building um, web businesses, so for my local estate agent, I built them a, a website. But I couldn't figure out how to plug the database in, and so I had to hand code every single new page for every new property, which was a blessing and a curse, because every time they wanted to update it, they had to pay me more money to like go in and, uh, it was absolutely great, recurring revenue. Um, but yeah, I never thought you could do it as a job. You know, No one around me worked with computers, uh, which sounds strange today, but in 1998, in Little Chalfont in Buckinghamshire, Everyone, or everyone's parents at least, was a banker or a lawyer or an accountant or a, a teacher or something, some professional career. Um, and no one worked with computers. It was, it looks crazy in retrospect, but bizarre. And what drove you to start or think about businesses? Or even, actually, before I do that, what made, why did you go to university? If you had this drive at 17, you were already doing it. You, yeah, I, because I didn't know what I was doing. So at seven, I built, the, my first like, paid website was wilsonheal.co.uk, which is still online. Um, and then my dad had a couple of rental properties in London, so I built um, Capital Rentals, which is basically uh, like Rightmove or Zoopla. But I built it in 1998. And I built this, and I was like, I put my dad's two properties on, and I was like, why isn't it growing? <laughs> <laughs> and I had no idea like, how to market it or whatever. And at the time, um, I think Loot, was a big thing. It was like yes. this free paper. And my dad used to advertise there. And he's like, why don't you just phone every single one of these landlords in loot and just phone them up and say you'll put it on your website for free? Or you could even like, send them a bottle of champagne. And so he had all of these ideas. And I was like, oh, sounds like quite a lot of work. Uh, so I'm just going to go back to coding websites. I, I don't know. I think with a little bit, if I had 
I don't know, maybe maturity or someone with some kind of like marketing drive, but I don't know. But you thought university. Uh, even all, after all that stuff, and yeah. you imagine it, you, cap, you know, this thing obviously captured your imagination in so many ways. And. Yeah, it, it, just like it was the, it was like I was on a conveyor belt. You know, I was 14, 15, 16. I was at a grammar school. I did pretty well in the exams. And so it was just like the choice was Oxford or Cambridge. It, genuinely in the school, they were like, for youth, youth 30 or 40 people, the main choice is Oxford or Cambridge. And then you choose law or history or, or medicine. It's like, that was just, we were put through these prep classes um, at a state grammar school, but it was very much like there is no other option. Um, and I don't regret it. I think I had an amazing, amazing time at Oxford. I, I built my first proper company there that got investment. I met a, a lot of great people that I'm, I'm still in contact with. Um, it, it was incredible. Um, so how many entrepreneurial ventures would you say you've had so far? <laughs> it's too many to count. Uh, every time... I just did so many like small things. So I was really into like the idea of supper clubs. So I built, um, I can't even remember the name now. The idea was like Airbnb, but for meals. So like if you cooked, I loved cooking, but obviously maybe I didn't have enough friends. So it was like, if you cook a big meal, you can invite 10 or 15 friends local, or like people you didn't know to come and like eat at your table. Uh, I built another website called Card Hero. If anyone, I got a great domain for that one. The idea was, um, I always forget to send like, greetings cards or birthday cards to all of my relatives and they kind of hate me for it. And so why can't you automate that? So you enter all the, the details of your, you know, your granny and Card Hero will handwrite a card and post it to them. So I built that with two friends on a holiday to Cancun, bizarrely. Just spent like 24 hours That's hacking this thing. So like literally dozens and dozens and dozens. But you couldn't even have a lot of drive. Who's thinking of starting their own business here? Or, okay, it's quite a few, not many. Um, Great. So that, look, that's a great uh, outline and setting for what we're going to talk about next, which is the future of banking. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that you said to me was uh, banks build products mainly for themselves. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. It, it seems like banks are really, really focused on solving their own problems. And their own problems are typically how do we sell more mortgages and how do we do so at lower cost? And they, they don't really stop to question, like, is that a great objective for us or not? It's just so intrinsically ingrained in anyone in the bank. You're like, I'm the mortgage person. I'm the credit card person. And so they're siloed along product lines, and they optimize the, the P&Ls of that product. And they don't step back to think, like, how can I make my customer's life better? And that's, that sort of explains how they've got themselves into this situation where when you interact with your bank, it's like you have to contort yourself around their products. You know, if you ever tried to uh, apply for a mortgage, it's an incredibly painful process. Whereas if they start with a human being, it's like, what are you trying to achieve? It's like, well, I'd like to buy a home, and I'd like to not have a shit ton of hassle, please. So can you make those two things possible? And then you get companies like Habito and Trussell that actually make this a lot easier. Um, so the banks, I think, have got it they're just the wrong way around. So are we at the very beginning of huge disruption in the banking industry? Let's just be specific about that sector. I, I, mean, I think so. The very famous Bill Gates quote was uh, something like, um, the world needs banking, but it doesn't need banks. I think that's sort of right. Um, so you don't describe yourselves as a bank? We are a bank. Ah, like, okay. We are technically, <laughs> like, absolutely, we are a bank. System. And we have obligations as a bank. But we, we are a bank as an enabler of the other stuff we want to do. We're not as a bank as the goal. And other people start banks because they want to really run a bank. Um, I really want to build a service that helps people manage their lives better. And the most expedient way to do that in 2018 is to become a bank. I don't think that is necessarily true in 10 years' time. I think the way the industry is developing is um, what I've called a hub and spoke model. So previously, you sign up very young with NatWest, say, and they sell you a student loan, and then a credit card, and then a car loan, and then a mortgage, and then blah, 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 blah. You get it all from one place. And we've seen a disaggregation. So TransferWise does foreign exchange really well, and Habito and Trussell do mortgage broking really well. A bunch of other companies that do these kind of single products really, really well. But as a customer, what that means is you have to maintain 15 or 20 different accounts to run your life, which is very inconvenient, actually. So what I think we'll see is a re-aggregation around um, platforms or marketplaces. So the bank is a hub or a control center. So it's the single interface that you use to visualize all of your money, and then you plug in spokes. 
and each spoke is from a different balance sheet provider, but it's customized to your needs. So it might be TransferWise for foreign exchange, or you want to get a loan and you plug in, I don't know, Lendable or Zopa or someone, or you have some money to invest and you're plugging in um, Rate Setter or Scalable Capital or, or Barclays Bank even. And so I think banks have a choice. They either become that user interface, that control center, they're really good on brand and customer service and real-time interaction, or you become a balance sheet. And you, do, you originate financial products at very, very slim operating margins, you use technology to automate the hell out of it, but you don't invest too much in brand or customer service because it's price-led. So if you're a mortgage brokers, companies like Shawbrook, Aldermore, Paragon, Oak North, Mast Haven, Charter Court, like, you've never heard of them. But if you look at the, the, the best buy tables, they're all at the top. They're offering the, the best priced products to meet customer segments' needs, and they're not worrying about the branch nav and all the other faff. And they plug into a hub like Monzo really, really well. It's a really symbiotic relationship. The big banks, I think, are stuck in the middle where they're trying to do everything, but they have overheads of this crazy branch network, 50,000 staff, and then they're spending billions of pounds on IT. So they can't do the customer interface well, and they can't do the balance sheet products well, and I think they're doomed. So a good analogy from what you're saying, it sounds like you want to be the OS, and then you've got these applications that might be loans, mortgages, but you want to be the payment network that collects the intelligence on us, the customer. Yeah, I think we have a lot more in common with a payment network than necessarily a big balance sheet bank. Mm -hmm. So the things that matter to us are a transaction processing, doing that in real time, doing it securely and scalably, and, uh, and making sure that it's transparent to the customer, but not necessarily taking massive credit risk. I think we are also really good at consumer interface. And so um, mm. the OS app thing works to an extent, but it's, I think it's wrong to the extent that like, you just don't interact with your mortgage that often. You plug it in as a kind of source of capital, but the actual UI interaction layer is probably best done by us, not by the, the mortgage people. They're just not very good at it. We are not very good at assessing creditworthiness on, on residential property, though. So again, it's really symbiotic. Tom, what keeps you awake at night apart from scaling a business? I mean, how many people work now at uh, Monzo? About 350, something like in that. In the space of what, three years? Yeah. Yeah, so that's crazy growth. Um, is it, is it uh, Facebook will just do this? Because they're doing it in China. Well, not they, well, WeChat is doing it. And then, yeah. as we know, they're copying a lot of what, they're, what WeChat are doing. Or is it a nimble startup that comes from Buckinghamshire, <laughs> the next Tom? Tom Jr. Yeah. You know, what, what, what is it that keeps you awake? If at all, maybe you just sleep like a king. I sleep really well at the moment, and that hasn't always been true for the last three years, but I think we're in a great place. Um, I'm really, really happy with the way the business is. Um, in terms of competitive threats, I am most, I'm not very worried, first of all. Um, I think we'd, I'm very, very excited about Monzo over the next sort of 24 months. If I was to pick the biggest threat, it would be a a disruptive model that doesn't exist yet. I don't really worry about Apple or Amazon or Google or Facebook kind of creeping into this area. I don't really worry about the big banks reacting because I think they're just um, way too slow. I worry that there is a new model that we have not yet spotted that is going to erupt from nowhere, take massive market share in a year, and become that single interface, probably on top of open banking. So some kind of aggregating layer that works really, really well. And there are a few out there. They just don't. They, they haven't really broken into the mainstream yet for whatever reason. But if someone can crack that model, I think you can get 10 or 20 million customers in a single year and just take the market. So that's something we occasionally think about, but hasn't happened yet. But are you thinking that in the model of a hub and spoke model? For sure, yeah. OK. But well, would blockchain completely change that hub and that need for hub and spoke model and decentralized networks where I'm just a customer amongst many other customers? in a decentralized network, rather than having a hub that is, knows me. Yeah. I'm known by lots of people. Is that, is that, is that what you're? No, I, I'm <laughs> skeptical on okay. blockchain. Mm. I think. Um, so no cryptocurrency coming out of Monzo next. No. Our regulator also is very <laughs> cautious. And as a regulated bank, it's something we have to, they're cautious about cryptocurrency. Um, Blockchain for me, so let's separate. But banks are always cautious, right? That's Bank of England, yeah, they're always cautious. We have to they be have because to be. We're, we're, we are regulated. Um, there's crypto assets, which to me seems like uh, 
very volatile and meets a certain customer need for like speculation, let's say. Then there's blockchain as an enabler of kind of technological progress. On that latter part, I think people often mistake software with blockchain. They're like, we could do this with blockchain. It's like, replace blockchain with just software, and it's still true. Uh, I think blockchain has really interesting properties, not, not having to have a centralized, sort of trusted party. But actually, uh, I think a lot of times people want and expect a central trusted party to fix it for them when it goes wrong. And so like, people who are not software engineers often get very excited about blockchain, and you need to actually just explain to them just well-written software accomplishes exactly what you've just said. It's not a, it's a magic kind of solution. And you're building it out of London. Is that where your main team is? Or is yep. it, are you co-located in other places? Uh, we have a smallish office in Cardiff um, that focuses more on customer service. Um, but it. London is our, is our main office. Most of it, we have 250 people there or something. And what, what does the, your f workforce look like? Or your employees look like in multiple languages? How many, how many nationalities are we talking about? Oh my gosh. Uh, 50 or 60 nationalities for sure. Uh, very, very widely across Europe and then less so outside Europe. Um, we publish a bunch of blog posts on, on mm. diversity of workforce, so you can kind of go and read the stats. I don't have them top of mind, but uh, it's, uh, it's very, very international. And how would you say is the... I can tell the, what question's coming next. No, not at all. No, no. <laughs> the, the, where's, the big where's, word. Well, no, the, where's the talent coming from for you, I mean, Tom? Because you've done a fantastic job. As I said, 350 people in three years. That's staggering growth, and you obviously have to have to get the best people you could find to build a billion-dollar company so far. You know, where do they come from? Um, Singapore, no. Uh, no, a lot of Just, Europeans, really a lot. Okay. Uh, I okay. mean, probably forty or fifty percent will be British, maybe slightly higher now. Another forty percent will be European, and then maybe ten or twenty percent outside Europe. The the visa process is a pain, so the advantage of being in a single market is you can attract a software developer from France and they can start on Monday. Whereas if you attract them from the US, it's a three or four month process to get a visa. When I was uh, talking to Tom earlier, uh, he, I asked him, so what, you know, what is it that you wanna, what, who are the competitors that you wanna sort of get rid of? And he said, actually, I don't wanna get rid of anybody. I'm just doing what I think is right. And what is your ambition, Tom? I mean, you are, this is your, this, I, you had a go car list before this. Yeah, it's, it's doing very well. Now you got Monzo. Where is this going? Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the exciting thing is the the potential impact this has. So I, I think about impact in two ways. One is like the 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 depth on an individual level. So for an individual person, how much positive in, impact we have on their lives, and I think a lot. Even for, if you're an affluent customer in the West, we can save you a couple of thousand pounds a year. If you're someone without access to finance, we can help you get onto that ladder and, and stop getting ripped off by everyone, frankly. So on an individual level, we can have a pretty profound positive impact. And then you multiply it by scale. Who needs this? And I think the answer is everyone. And so that seems like a pretty good thing to spend the next 10 or 20 years working on. And you're you're on it. You're, yeah, we used to say we're building a, a financial control center for a billion people. And then we realized it wasn't ambitious enough because there are 7.7 .7 billion people. What about the other six or seven we weren't helping? So now it's just a, we've, a new mission statement will come out very soon, which is Monzo makes money work for everyone. Really, we're, we're trying to make money just work for you as an individual, but for everyone around the world. And money being sort of an exchange of a stored value. Yeah. An exchange of All of the problems around your money, right? It's not like just savings accounts and mortgages, but like the annoying crap that lives around your money that causes you like administrative headaches, switching your gas and electricity, uh, making sure you're on the best mortgage deal, uh, renewing your car insurance, getting cash back and loyalty points that you redeem before they expire, uh, paying your mate back 10 quid for, for pizza last night, saving up for a, a house or putting your kids through a, a, a school. All of those things are irritating and annoying, require painful sort of work, and software is really good at solving those problems. And that's, those 700 people, 700,000 people, of which quite a few of you are here, how many are aged between, let's say, I don't know, can, is it, you have to be over 18, right? Currently over 18, we, we are planning to reduce that. 
Uh, so look, look out for news. Uh, but right now it's 18 or over, so probably 60% are 18 to 30, okay. and then another 25% are 30 to 40, and the remaining, whatever that adds up to, 15% are over 40. Terrific. So look, we have one minute left, Tom, and what is it that you want to say about entrepreneurship in general and to any sort of aspiring, budding entrepreneurs that really want to sort of look, to, look up to you as a, as, a, as a role model, I think. <laughs> uh, you have been described, he has been described as the Mark Zuckerberg of, of the UK, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, no comment. <laughs> um, uh, I think of the banking, best... I should say. Is the Facebook of banking or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, um, I think the best way to learn how to start a company is to start a company. And lots and lots of people fail, including myself. Right? Like I have launched probably 10 or 12 different services that got no more than a dozen users, and probably one of those was my mum. So failure is not a bad thing. The thing that differentiates you is persistence. So you can fail a couple of times and give up, and you have a great career in law or, or investment banking or teaching, whatever it is you want to do. Um, but persist, like try it and persist, I think is, is, is great. You hear about these amazing, like crazy growth curves. I saw the guy who founded um, Code Academy, who was in my Y Combinator batch. I saw him a couple of days ago. And they launched and had 200,000 customers over a weekend. That is the exception. <laughs> you look at Airbnb, those guys yeah. slogged it out for two yeah. years or something right. without any customers. It was absolutely amazing, just the perseverance. So start something and keep going. And have a vision, right? Yeah, terrific. Well, look, please put your hands together for Tom. That was great. Thank you.